part three, chapter two. The first Monday in April was cold and rainy. The boat rocked so much on Sunday night, I hardly slept. There aren't many Mondays when I'm eager to go to school, but that was one. I wanted off the boat. On Mondays, the hallways at Lincoln are always loud. Kids are talking about their weekends, the sports they played, the dates they had, the beer they drank. But when I stepped inside Lincoln that morning, I knew something was wrong. It was too quiet and too many kids were clumped together, their faces glum. Melissa was in a corner with Annie and Natasha. We hadn't talked much since the night at the Blue Note, but as soon as she saw me, she came over. Have you heard? She asked. Her voice was shaky as if she were about to cry. Heard what? About Brent Miller? What about Brent Miller? He's dead. I stared at her. He's dead? How? He was on patrol in Iraq. There was some sort of, bo sort of bomb on a bridge and two soldiers died. He was one of them. Are you sure? She nodded. It was on the radio this morning. The news stuff gets stuff wrong. The news gets stuff wrong all the time. You know that. Chance, he's dead. The first bell sounded. I've got to go, Melissa said. I've got calculus tests, and I don't know how I'm going to do any calculus today. All day I kept hoping to see Melissa so I could talk to her some more, but I didn't see her again until Arnold's class. Even then she came late, so I had no chance to speak with her before class. Arnold looked old as he stood in front of us. The room was totally quiet as he pulled down the map of the world. I know you've all heard the no news about Brent Miller, he said, his voice weary. I don't know much, but I'll tell you the little I do know. It happened outside of Baghdad. Brent was assigned to. As Arnold talked, I tried to listen, but my mind kept drifting back to September. I saw Miller standing in front of the class again. I remembered the way he'd acted, both that day and before. I hadn't liked him, and I didn't feel bad about not liking him, but I didn't want him to be dead. I didn't want anybody to, anybody to be dead. I looked at Arnold. You hear, that one, you hear that one soldier was killed here or two there, he was saying, and it doesn't make much of an impact. But each one of those soldiers had a family, has friends, has a story, just like Brent did. Every one of them has a life they never get to, got to lead. When class ended, we all filed out silently. But as soon as we were in the hall, Brian Mitchell confronted Melissa. I bet you're happy, he hissed. The dumb soldier got what he deserved. That's what you're thinking. You should join Al-Qaeda if you hate America so much. Go bow down to Allah. You make me sick. Melissa's face went white and she burst into tears. I stepped between Brian and her. Shut up, Mitchell, I said. He wheeled around. Don't tell me to shut up. I'll say whatever I want to. You're as bad as she is anyway. A crowd had formed around us. You're being a moron, Brian, I said. That's when he started throwing punches. I should have been expecting it. But I didn't get my hands up until he smacked me once right in the face. I grabbed him around the waist and wrestled him to the ground. We thrashed around trying to punch each other for a minute or so. Then somebody grabbed me from behind. And I guess that somebody must have grabbed him too. A minute later, I heard Arnold's voice. What's going on here? Nothing, I said, twisting free from whoever was holding me. What do you mean nothing? I mean nothing. So why is your nose bleeding? I put my hand to my face and felt the hot blood. It's nothing, I repeated. It's nothing, Arnold said. He looked at, it's not nothing, Arnold said. He looked to Brian Mitchell. Both of you, come with me. Once we reached the main office, Arnold went to find the nurse, Miss Tolbert. She handed me a small towel and had me lean forward and pinch my nose. Don't lean your head, lean your head back or you'll swallow your own blood. I was still pinching my nose when Miss Dugan appeared in the doorway. Come with me, she said. I followed her to her office. Brian Mitchell was slouched in a chair by the window, his arms folded across his chest. Dugan motioned for me to sit in the chair next to him. You fight, you get suspended. It's that simple. We have a zero tolerance policy and you both know it. She picked up the telephone. I'm calling your folks. Chance, what's your phone number? I looked at the floor. Come on, what's your number? I can get it from the secretary, you know. I don't have a phone number, I said. What do you mean you don't have a phone number? Just what I said. How about a cell phone? I shook my head. Your mom or dad got a work number? Again, I shook my head. So how does a person get in touch with them? Miss Dugan, I'm pretty much on my own, so if there's something you want to say, just say it to me. Brian cleared his throat. How about if Chance and me just shake hands and go home? Brian turned to look at me. You'll shake my hand, won't you? Sure, I said. I'll shake your hand. He stuck out his hand and I shook it. Okay, Mitchell said, looking to Dugan. Dugan stared at me and then at Mitchell. All right, I'll ignore what happened, but this ends here, you understand? You two don't even bump shoulders in the hall or I will suspend you. I nodded, so did Brian. Dugan motioned with her right hand. Go on, get out of here. Brent Miller has us all frazzled. Mitchell and I walked down the long empty hall side by side. I tried to think of something to say, but nothing came to me. When he reached the main doors, he pushed them open and took two stairs.